American Numismatic Society, and I want to welcome everybody today to the 160th an annual meeting of the American Numismatic Society here in New York. Uh, the, to move it along, our first order, order of business is the approval of the minutes of the last meeting, of, annual meeting, which was held on October 29th, 2016. A copy of the minutes, if you haven't, you probably received them in your mailing, but there's an extra copy on the back table if anybody still wants to pick it up. Can I hear a motion? So moved. Okay. Do I hear a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Great. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our the society's president, Sid Martin, who will continue with the meeting. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today. Uh, we have uh, a, a good attendance, and it's nice to see your faces again. I'd particularly like to uh, say thank you to Arthur Houghton, a, a former position of this uh, presidency. Uh, for, for joining us. It's nice to have you. All right. Uh, today, uh, I actually uh, am ready to begin my, my sixth year here as, as president, which is a little bit hard to believe, but true. And I'm pleased to address you briefly about the accomplishments we've, uh, we've uh, achieved over the last uh, year or so. Um, as trustees, we're, we're very proud of the many achievements this, this society has made. Uh, and this is because of a staff that is incredibly dedicated. Uh, if you're unaware, we probably have, I think it is fact that we have the smallest staff at this point in time that we've ever had. Is that correct? Yeah. And yet they are still uh, making these tremendous achievements. Um, I don't think that would be possible if it weren't for our executive director, who also is, I should say, busting out. Okay, you can interpret that however you wish. <laughs> so, uh, you'll hear more about the accomplishments as we go through the day as each of the individual presenters uh, highlight some of their accomplishments. But uh, if you have questions, by all means ask about them. We're very proud of them. Y we have, for the first time, we've, we've published a, a, a really beautiful annual report. We have a few copies at the back, if you'd like to pick one up. But in light of our desire to save the trees and to stay with high technology, we have, it is on the net, uh, you, where you can get a PDF copy. But I encourage you to take a look at it. It is really, really nice and, and does highlight our accomplishments. That couldn't have been done without the staff members, particularly under Eshel Kreider and Emma Pratt is our Director of Development and our membership, respectively. Um, our finances this year have been particularly good. Uh, there have been some one-time events that have occurred, and there are some uh, rather exceptional uh, things that have happened. We received another uh, NEH grant. Uh, the Mellon Foundation stepped in with, with uh, 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 awards or, or grants to us. And we had two very uh, gracious anonymous donors who helped us achieve, I, I guess, pretty much record contributions this year. Uh, and that's very good. Um, we have discussed this. We, we certainly don't want to get complacent over where we are and the, 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 the financial uh, good we've had this year. But we, we think it's set the stage and the, the foundation for moving ahead in a better position than what we have seen over the past several years. Uh, ha having said this, and, and as a part of this, we, we remain aware of the, the physical, physical constraints of the, the organization, and our duty as is, is trustees to, to be able to achieve the least costs, the operating costs, and the things of that sort, without digging into our endowment funds. Uh, you'll hear later uh, about what the endowment funds are, and I, I, I trust you'll be reasonably pleased. It's been a good year in part thanks to the stock market, but in part due to the uh, stewardship that's been uh, exercised on those funds as well. We're trying to stay ahead of the game with adopting uh, sophisticated technical innovations. Uh, we're making incredible use of the internet. Uh, we're, we're dealing with, with website applications, our, our data platforms, our digitization. These are things that are just um, difficult to under, or to difficult to overestimate in terms of what we've been able to accomplish and where we're getting. 
Uh, and, and again, as I said, you'll, you'll hear more about these as we go. Uh, one that I'm uh, particularly proud of that's been introduced this year, and, and I know the staff is as well, is a new series of Money Talks lecture cities, uh, series. This is where we're planning on having 11 uh, lectures a year, uh, laying off during August when everyone is on vacation. On, on a variety of topics and having these lectures on like a Saturday where people can come in and, and uh, they don't have to take off time work, they can, they can really sit down and enjoy each other's company and they have proven this year to be a, a tremendous success. Um, those have been enabled by a, 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 a donation in honor of a, a Dr. and Mrs. Um, uh, Chane Stefanelli and we'd like to thank uh, the endowment fund and the donor for them. We continue to look ahead, uh, as we continue to look ahead, the trustees and ANS staff are grateful to our loyal members, you guys and the ones who were unable to attend, uh, for the generosity you've expressed in terms of, of uh, your giving of time, dues, appeals, uh, things of that sort, really keeping us in, in good shape. Uh, an example of what one individual did, uh, Stanley, um, DeForest Stone, uh, that's Scott, us, Scott. Uh, yes, Scott, is uh, an upcoming auction on the 8th of November, maybe see the 8th or 9th, 8th of November, where he has given a, a, a really nice collection of Washington medals that will be auctioned off to benefit the, our campaign to raise an endowment for the chair of the executive director. Uh, as you know, uh, a few years ago, like <coughs> two, two years ago, we decided to, to, to raise the endowment for a chair to cover the cost of the executive director. Our goal was, was four plus million, and we're creeping up on that. We're, we're not quite to two yet, but we're getting there. And so uh, we're looking for additional help to, to make that happen. Also, I'd like to express my gratitude to the, the Board of Trustees. Um, I, I think so, sometimes people maybe underestimate what the, what the, the board brings to it. They're, they're a diverse group of individuals from different backgrounds, academic, business, and so on, that, that take their time and effort to really keep this organization on track. And keeping some people in this organization on track isn't always easy, <laughs> but very appreciated, okay? Uh, particularly, there are two um, trustees that retired over the past year or, or left office for one reason or other, and I would very much like to, to recognize them. First is Richard Eiswick. He joined the ANS in 1998. He became a life associate in 1999 and was elected to the Board of Trustees in 2008. He was one of the founding members of the Sage Society here and has been a generous donator to the Newell Publication Fund, the Margaret Thompson Curator of Greek Coins Fund, the ANS Annual Appeals, and notably toward uh, one of this year's long-awaited publications, that being the Numismatic Studies Number 33, entitled Coins, Artists, and Tyrants, Tyrants uh, Syracuse in the Time of the Peloponnesian War. He, he's been one of a man of strong opinions, uh, but we welcomed his, uh, his conversations and addresses and talks with us uh, during the, the board agendas. Um, Mike Casvoda was elected to the board in 2010. He served as our first vice president since 2014, uh, up until 2014, and, and he has been a member since he resigned uh, for personal reasons last November. He's been a member of the ANS since 1996 and a SAGE member since 2010. He has collected <coughs> coins for decades, specializing in Greek coinage of Magna Graecia and Sicily, Renaissance medals, and now most recently in U.S. large sense. As a trustee, he chaired the Strategic Planning and Development Personnel Committees and generously supported the ANS programs and appeals. He was very uh, instrumental in the Digitization Fund and, and has helped uh, in the creation of this, this campaign for the, the, to fund the endowment for the Executive Director's Chair. We were fortunate to have his dedicated input and advice and his hard work on the committees <coughs> and, and would like to thank him for his time. On behalf of all the trustees and staff, I really want to express my sincere uh, thanks to these two uh, retiring uh, trustees. 
I want to thank the nominees that were up for re-election and election to the Board of Trustees today. Uh, I, I look forward to their participation, the new ones, the ones that are coming back, I thank them again. Uh, we're fortunate to have such a, a, a group of candidates. Uh, and we're going to continue to push forward with the, uh, the, the, the accomplishment of missions of the, the ANS. And at that point, I'd like to uh, address the fact that one of the, not, not concerns, one of the issues that the board is, is um, concerned with is looking at where we're going to go strategically. We, we know that we can operate day to day, but we need to have some sort of a plan that says here's where we're going to go long term and then here's how we're going to step by step achieve that long term goal. Uh, and at that point I'd like to introduce uh, Jerome de Wild, uh, who we asked to sort of chair a, a, a look at what this should be. But <coughs> and the object really is to tell you the, the, the members we are concerned with the long term success of the organization. We're planning for the long term, we're figuring out how to get there. And Jerome, I think, has done a, a first class job in, in taking the steps to show us how that can, can occur from a, a planning point of view. Jerome? Does this work? Okay. Well, um, good evening. My name is Jerome DeVilla, one of the trustees. Um, does it work like this? Yeah. The speak in the mic. Like this? Oh. Yeah, it's being recorded. Oh. Okay. <laughs> um, I am, yes. Um, so basically, I was asked to, uh, by uh, one of them was Mike, uh, but Uta as well, to uh, to look at the strategy plan. And um, Andrew Burnett also said, you know, maybe you should ask Jerome to do something. And I introduced something that's called a fishbone. Um, it's uh, stuff that I used to, in my work, I used to do in my work. And that's connected to a strategy. So a strategy is basically planning for the future. Where do you want to go in uh, in five years' time? And then you try to uh, to to uh, cut that down. So here's the mission that we want to have, um, uh, and the vision that we uh, what we where we want to go. And basically, if you put it in other words, it would say we want to be damn good in in numismatics, and everybody wants to look at us. If they have a question about that, it doesn't mean that we are competitive. We don't want to compete with other numismatic organizations, organizations, but we just want to strive to be the best. Um, if you want that, you have some strengths and weakness and opportunities and threats that's, uh, that, uh, that you have to face. So the strengths and weaknesses are, are in the organization itself, and the opportunities and threats are working from the outside in. So looking at that, the INS considers itself as uh, very strong in a, a, a lot of things, so collection, library, publications, uh, it's a knowledge center, there's a good staff and organization, digital capabilities are on for decades, and uh, there's a focus. So if you translate it, the focus in Uta's word is basically if we choose to do something, we do it damn well. Um, also we have weaknesses. Um, there are problems to get uh, budget neutral. Uh, and that's because of being in New York is a very expensive operation. Not only the rent, but to pay the staff is, uh, is, is not cheap. Um, and these, the membership base for an organization like this is actually very small. So these are the things that we need to work on for the coming, for coming five years. So the opportunities are, it's a willing environment, otherwise you wouldn't have been here at all. Um, and it continues to be uh, uh, willing the image is very good. Myself coming from uh, the, from Europe, I, the first name I heard uh, in the international numismatics was the ANS. Um, we can broaden the membership base, and there are some uh, program innovations that were already mentioned, like uh, money talks. So did we decided last year that we should reach out, reaching out to member to um, to the public is uh, is now one of the main um, uh, program items. Somebody decided, I think it was David, said we should have a, a social gathering and that turned into money talks before we knew it. So the operational excellence of the ANS is very good, which is which helps. You know, there are a lot of societies that just talk and don't do. The threats is, uh, again, cost of housing in the, I must repeat this word, if I pronounce it wrongly, 
please excuse my Dutch accent, disenchantment with numismatics because of counterfeiting cashless economy and um, in strict import and export rules. So every day Ute comes in, um, she says, I like your fishbone. Basically it's a, a prioritization. So the first thing she does is reaching out, giving lectures and stuff like that, as the, the whole staff is doing as well. Um, the other one is, uh, is the housing. So we would like to have better access uh, place where you can access the, uh, the, the collection in the library not on the 11th floor, where you pay a lot of money. Uh, increase the funding and increase the membership base. However, um, there are some day-to-day -day operations that, uh, that uh, needs to be done, and they're always in the way. So um, this is what we, uh, so if you have to plan your, your weakness and your opportunity, your strengths and your weakness and your opportunities and threats, then you try to slice it down into um, fields of work that leads towards a long-term goal. And we call that a fishbone. Um, so normally these are more detailed, but just for a quick overview, I took out all the text. We look at library, publication, finance, and a collection and curator, and that will be that will lead to um, quantified deliveries. So we want to have 11 uh, money talks a year, for instance. And then we mine the mission, and then the circle is back to where you started. The mission is improve knowledge and understanding of numismatics. So that's what we're here for, and this is how we operate. There are more slides, but I would like to leave it like with this. If there are any questions, then I would like to introduce um, the report of the first president, first vice president, and uh, the second vice president, Andrew Burnett and David Hennen. Thank you. Uh, Andrew and I have uh, the uh, distinct pleasure to, uh, to talk to you today uh, about a couple of people um, that we are uh, honoring. Uh, when you all come in, you see the plaques uh, of the donors uh, over the decades uh, to the ANS. And uh, you probably know that the plaques on that donor wall acknowledge gifts of $500,000 or more. Uh, sometimes cash, sometimes coins, other numismatic material over a period of time, uh, single donations, multiple donations. This year we have unveiled two new donor plaques in... <laughs> well, wait, 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 wait for it. <laughs> wait. The reveal... This oh. is actually uh. what you need to use. Back, you have to use that. I Yep. There you go. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Ken Edlow and, and Sid Martin. Um, they're the 89th and 90th plaques in our, on, our, on our wall. <laughs> and, and they actually begin a new row uh, uh, um, that is an acknowledgement of generosity going back for the 160 year history of the ANS. Um, so I get to, and, I, and no, no chore, I get to talk about my friend Ken Edlow. Uh, um, Ken... Uh, next, next slide, next slide. Oh, next slide, sorry. <laughs> ah, there he is. Okay. <laughs> Just in case you didn't know who he was. Sorry, yeah. <laughs> so there's a number of remarkable things about Ken, but I'll just tell you that he's been a member of the ANS since 72, which is about the same time that I joined. He was elected a fellow in 1991 and elected to the Board of Trustees in 93, and he became a Life Fellow in 96. He served on the Executive Committee since 2009, also on the Finance Committee that long, and since 2009, he has been annually elected and re-elected as the chairman of the Board of Trustees. Now, Ken uh, retired uh, a few, not so many years ago, as the secretary of Bear Stearns. And since he retired, he has been coming to the ANS virtually every day. He has an office, and uh, he, he comes and he, he works. Uh, he kind of does whatever is needed if if uh, tourists show up because they read about the ANS in a tour guide book and uh, er everybody's really busy, then Ken is the guy who comes out and shows them around. 
if a uh, visiting scholar comes and wants to examine uh, some of the coins from the collection in the vault, and of course because of security, somebody always needs to babysit that person, and if Elaine is busy, uh, Ken does that. Uh, I, I actually haven't seen him cleaning up yet, <laughs> but, um, but, but he is here, he, he is smiling, he and, he, uh, and he offers advice and dimension uh, uh, in so many ways uh, uh, and support to all of the staff, especially to Uta, but also uh, to the rest of us. Um, we're, we're also grateful that uh, since uh, that, that he originally was assistant secretary, uh, of the uh, trustees since 2016 he's also been the treasurer and as the treasurer he oversees literally on a daily basis all of the investments of our endowment he watches uh, the money he keeps in touch with the people who are investing us it he explains to us what it means uh, when things happen um, and and he's just it's he's just it's a it's a remarkable opportunity to have somebody uh, of, of his quality here with us. Um, and, uh, and I also have to say that the other really remarkable thing is that Ed is not and never has been a coin collector. <laughs> he got involved in this because I suspect that in 1972 his father joined him up as a member of the society. <laughs> and, uh, but his dedication has, has been unquestioned. Uh, not only has he helped us administratively, monetarily, but when the Hispanic Society coin collection of some 4,000 coins, uh, when it was sort of revealed in a great surprise to the ANS that those coins did not really belong to the ANS, and the Hispanic Society had fallen on hard times and was insisting on selling those coins, we did everything we could do, the ANS did everything we could do to try to prevent that. When we couldn't, Ken Edlow stepped up and bought the collections, and bought all the coins, and, uh, and is in the process of giving them back to the ANS this year alone, and you'll hear more about this later from Elena, but this year alone, he redonated uh, 2,000, or more than 2,000, of the uh, uh, Hispanic Society coins to the ANS. Uh, it's really remarkable. He's a remarkable person. We have a board uh, of trustees filled with really interesting uh, 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 people who, who are interested in coins or the society for a number of reasons. Now, this is my first time addressing this group as the first vice president. Uh, and uh, as I introduce uh, the second vice president, I only want to say that it is only in this bizarre world that I am number one to Andrew Burnett's number two <laughs> in anything related to any area of numismatics. <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, number one. Uh, <laughs> we have cups that say thing one and thing two. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but we have, as you know, two people we're honoring today in, in great and equal honour. And so I've been uh, asked to give them the privilege of saying just a few words about uh, Sid, Sid Martin, who introduced proceedings uh, a few minutes ago. So he's been a member of the ANS since 1996 and a life member since uh, 2000 and designated a life fellow in 2009. He first joined the Board of Trustees in 2005, and of course he's served on many uh, ANS board committees since then, including the Finance Committee, and was Treasurer from 2009 to 2012, the year that he was elected uh, President of the Society, which we're all delighted as an office he's still continuing to exercise uh, today. Uh, as well as his uh, great contribution to the organization and uh, administration of the society, he's also very distinguished for his own, uh, his own academic and intellectual uh, endeavors. Uh, many of you will know he specializes in colonial American coinage, uh, and he's written many articles to the subject in Colonial Newsletter, presented papers at COAC, uh, and, and many historical societies and clubs. In the last, uh, over the last few years, he's written uh, three uh, major books, The Hibernia Coinage of William Wood, The Rosa American Coinage of William Wood, and French Coinage specifically for Colonial America just a couple of years ago. Uh, and uh, we were delighted to discover yesterday there's another blockbuster uh, coming uh, very soon. Um, and we hope that uh, Sid, much as well as all his other duties, will continue to produce this great stream 
of uh, intellectual um, uh, publications. His, uh, his business expertise, his keen intellect, his professionalism, and his uh, personal demeanor. I'm just reading this. Somebody thinks Sid has a personal demeanor. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> why not? Why not? Um, along with, of course, I have to mention, I hope it, went, it, it would embarrass us in England, but perhaps not you here, his generous monetary giving has benefited the society's programs and initiatives in so many ways. He was one of the founding members of the Augustus B. Sage Society. He's uh, sponsored and co-sponsored ANS galas. He's made major gifts in support of a variety of funds, including the General Fund, the Library Catalogue Opposition, the Hudson Square Building Fund, in which in 2009 the Society's Conference Room, just uh, sort of behind you on the, on the right, uh, was named in his honour. And of course, as we heard earlier, the campaign to fund the Chair of Executive Director. So I think there's no doubt his commitment to the Society is truly notable in every way. So thank you very much, Sid, for everything you've done. Thank you. <laughs> and I call on uh, Mr. Robert Candell to introduce the next item. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Candell, and it's my pleasure to conduct the election and present the nominations to be put to a vote by the Fellows of the Society this afternoon. The Oh, there is a slide? There may not be, but Sid doesn't want us to keep staring at it. Which do you prefer? <laughs> I'll bow to Sid. There we are. The fellows of the society represent a maximum of 225, including life fellows and honorary life fellows, of the overall membership of the society. I am pleased to report that person to Article 3, Section 1 of the bylaws, five associate members were elected as fellows of the society at this morning's regular meeting of the Board of Trustees. And they are Mr. Peter Bartlett of Ciudad Cologne in Costa Rica, Mr. E. Tomlinson Fort of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Mr. Dell Parker of Dallas, Texas, Professor Gary Rieger of West Hartford, Connecticut, and Mr. John W. Wilson of Ocala, Florida. Pursuant to Article 3, Section 1 of the bylaws, the trustees also elected Mr. Alan Helms of Boston, Massachusetts as an Honorary Life Fellow. Pursuant to Article 3, Section 7 of the bylaws, again at this morning's meeting, the trustees designated ANS Fellow Mr. Glenn W. Barisak of Princeton, New Jersey as an Honorary Life Fellow. We'll now proceed to the election of trustees. The fellows of the society are entitled to vote at this meeting. Pursuant to Article 4, Section 6 of our bylaws, 20 fellows, present in person or by proxy, shall constitute a quorum. All fellows who are, pr who are present were asked to sign in before, and if you've not yet done so, please take care of that now, if you would. And if anyone is holding a proxy, please hand them in also to Joanne. Joanne, where are you? Oh, there you are. Okay. Now, may I have two ANS members who are not fellows of society volunteer to count the proxies? Thank you. I need one more. It's like an auction. Is there another member, please? All right, Peter. Thank you. you if you'd go uh, join Peter. While they are counting the proxies, let me share with you the names of the following six trustee candidates who have been nominated for election or re-election for the term ending in 2020. Perhaps those trustee candidates who are seated here in the room will please stand as I mention your name. Mr. Dan Hamelberg. Okay. Uh, Professor Sebastian Heath. Professor Andy Meadows is not here. He's in England. Mr. John Nebel, John, Dr. Christopher Salmon, and my, I'm also standing for election this year. Thank you. Now, is there a fellow who would second the nominations? Second. Thank you. And will those fellows who have not mailed in or handed in their proxies earlier please raise their hands in approval of the nominations? 
Uta, Joanne, would you please count these? Oh, you, you're already voting. Uh, Joanne will count them. Seventeen present, okay. And do we have a count from the other room yet? Uta didn't yes. sign in, so there's at least no, eighteen. Oh, he did? Okay. Yes, uh, 77. 77. There are 94 votes. Um, 17 hands raised, 77 county uh, proxies for a total of 94. Uh, the slate that has been nominated is hereby elected, and I thank you all and enjoy the afternoon. I'd now like to uh, ask Ken to come back up for the financial report, the treasurer's report. Okay, thank you. Now talking about uh, our finances. It's been a good year, as everyone knows, the, the, uh, for our fiscal year that end, ended on September 30th for the dose preceding 12 months, to give you a little bit of perspective, the S&P index was up about 18.5%. Uh, bonds were essentially flat depending on their maturities, so keep that in mind. We wound up with a gain of 12.8%, which is in line with what I just said, because about 70% of our portfolio is in equities, and about 30% is in debt instruments. So when you multiply 70 times the 18 and a half, you come down to around 12, 12 and a half percent. So we came in uh, in line with the indexes. Um, one of our uh, advisors, though, did particularly well, Douglas Lane, where we have $7 million invested. They were up 25% before the fee, their fee, against 186 So they did particularly well. It was a very good year for them. And we're adding a little bit some money. We just voted to add some money to, to the $7 million or so that we have with them. So anyway, we started the year with 41.3 million in the our endowment funds. We took out during the year 2.1 million to help pay the overhead here. We made f the 12 and a half, 12.8 percent. We made 53, 5,378,000. So we wound up the year at a 44 and a half million. 44 and a half, but about 70 percent equities, 30 percent fixed income, approximately. Um, with respect to our ability to come in at or near budget, we're pleased to say that we did. A certain amount of money was approved by the trustees to, uh, to be spent in um, fiscal year 17. Uh, just to give you the, the no number, looks like about 3.7 million, and we spent, spent perhaps 3.8 million. So it was very close, it was very close. And we, and that's, that's an, a real improvement over some of the prior periods, actually. Uh, okay, on that note, I think I can turn it over to our Executive Director, Uta Wartenberg, and she will continue with the meeting. Welcome um, all. I'm so pleased so many of you came and we had a very successful uh, trustees meeting with a, what we think almost record attendance, um, which as we have a very international board with people from all over the US and Europe, this is always a challenge. So I thank the trustees um, for all their support, but also, you know, for making the effort here. Um, the overview that I'm giving is a very short one these days for those of you who've been here for previous meetings um, because it's really the staff um, at the society that carries the main um, burden here and I'm just going to give a very quick overview to say this has been a particularly good year um, and the individuals in, in charge of the different departments will uh, really talk about this but I'd, I'd like to highlight the diversity of what we do these days, 
um, which as we have more staff to dedicate here at the society to various tasks, um, we've sort of began to outreach beyond our normal, you know, which was just publications and other things. And particularly pleased that um, we've struck relationships um, with an organization that regularly brings in uh, school children, both from high school and um, also from, uh, you know, younger children, as you see here. And of course, we continue our various programs, the summer seminar, um, you know, the publications, we have our blog. It's really an enormous variety, and I cannot emphasize enough how much the staff, and it is really a very small staff, maybe it's not the smallest quite where, where it was, there were periods when it was smaller, but considering that we're doing quite well, the individuals here, the entire staff works extremely hard. Um, you know, there's those of you who I attend the money talks, you see how many people appear always on weekends and, and work. And really, I think that everyone does it because people really enjoy it. We also enjoy the interaction with the members and many of our members have come in as volunteers and working with us. So on the whole, the programs, um, we keep developing them. We keep trying to bring them outside New York, but we have recently maybe we emphasized a little bit on creating more here in New York and the money talks that were already mentioned um, are the main uh, one that we have, which we don't always put out on, um, uh, we film and put out on YouTube. And here at this point, I'd like to mention and please spread the news that almost all our lectures appear on our YouTube um, channel, channel, ANS channel. Um, a lot of members are unaware of this, um, you know, in particular if they're not here in New York, but it's exactly for those people. And thanks to Alan Roach, they're really in fantastic quality. So, um, so programs going well. Um, of course, none of this would really be possible in the sense that has been mentioned by um, our president, um, Sid, without the support that we get and um, this has been a very good year and we had some very, very large uh, donations and I'm personally also very, very grateful um, to everyone and it's 232 individual members and foundations that have made donations, sometimes multiple ones, the individual gifts are much higher than this, of over $1.3 million, which is really in a regular year, there is no special sort of building fund is, is probably a record in particular for the um, general fund. And it's really because of a few key individuals that have stepped up. So um, I'd like to express my, um, my gratitude because we wouldn't be um, here without all that help. Um, the NEH has already been mentioned. We will received another grant this year and um, I'd like to extend my thank um, to everyone who worked on the first NEH grant, which was initiated by um, Andy Meadows, um, but carried out by Gilles Bransbourg and a very big team. They'll talk about more. But um, thank Peter van Alphen, who put together another grant and was awarded this um, for a project that he will introduce. And uh, you see, we were um, we have this in this building. It's one of these buildings where we have the famous posted war, which is that um, the building provides us with lots of post-it notes and then um, we thought we need to put something up and so we would, you know, I, I, we put this up, Joanne and I, one evening, um, you know, to thank the NEH and it was up there for a long time, it was extremely visible. Um, and of course, we already mentioned, you know, um, we have this wonderful tradition of putting up our biggest donors um, to recognize them. So. Um, um, Ken, and actually I want to emphasize your family, <laughs> <laughs> I know, um, and Sid, um, thank you so, so much for everything. Um, members, of course, you know, the society is really, I think the success of the American Numismatic Society is, bec is here because of its members, something that um, I think we've always recognized. We're so fortunate to be organized um, historically as a membership society because other people try and grant friends groups and so on. You know, our members come, they support us. And it is extraordinary how many life members we have, a life member um, honorary life member effectively becomes if you've paid dues for 50 years um, at that very point so keep paying your dues you get your free membership and um, with people some people joining extremely young um, this is not always a very good deal for the ANS but of course we consider it uh, something that is um, very good our, of course our oldest life member is um, Eric Newman um, <laughs> 
and uh, you know so something to live for but here this year I just want to mention um, those who have reached that milestone um, with um, Jerry who's actually here Jerry there he is yes um, as well as the other um, individuals and former trustee also um, Jack Kroll and other extremely well known you will recognize the names here of our members um, unfortunately um, I have to mention the passing of some of our members and uh, we don't always notice everyone but here the people that we've been uh, notified to date and, and again you see it's a sort of who is who of numismatics with um, Colin Bruce very well known uh, numismatist who worked for Krause and um, Catherine Bolivar Moore probably our um, you know most loyal um, uh, long-term donor together um, with her husband or former that you see here on that um, pic picture David Bolivar who had left us um, considerable archives and after she passed away we also um, received a bequest a uh, financial bequest from her and um, we really miss her I in particular was a wonderful lady um, which is a rarity in in this field um, Benjamin Bell, on the other hand, was a very young member of our uh, society and uh, it was very sad to see him um, pass away, who many of you I know uh, knew. Um, Emilio Paoletti, I'd like to acknowledge, maybe not known to everyone, someone that I knew quite well, um, very prolific uh, collector, one of the biggest collectors of Argentina and a very great author um, who regularly sent his books to the ANS um, Ed writer of the Numismatic Literary Guild, also very famous here in New York, of having um, written for many years a column for the New York Times. Wonderful man um, that Joanne and I dealt with until recently when he passed away. Um, Jack Schoenhardt, another well-known numismatist, as well as our two um, uh, Salters winner, Miko Kaufmann, Leander Finke, um, that um, you know were really great sculptures. These were all really names and it shows when you look over the names of people I recognize all of them and I apologize if maybe the two last people weren't really we didn't know that much about them but most of the people in our society we I know the members and most of the staff know them and we interact which is really rather nice um so we're really going to miss them and I'd like to close um by acknowledging that this year we've been fortunate. We have now a um, very um, really um, engaged um, curatorial staff and it changes a little bit. I um, recently decided that in order to cover the somehow more of a neglected areas where we don't have a good endowment to support this, that we would have um, a one-year fellowship and the first of these fellows um, was our uh, colleague Vivek Gupta, who um, has recently um, gone off to London to do a doctorate at uh, SOAS. He was with us for a year and covered the Islamic and South um, Asian section and it was an incredible addition to our team um, and we hope that um, hopefully by next year or maybe the year after we have again sufficient funds to bring a person in another area, um, you know, a student that can take um, a one-year position and helps us. I'd like to announce that um, we have two new curatorial associates and these are effectively not quite volunteers because they put a lot more time than, let's say, most volunteers. And um, Eric Kraus, um, actually here sitting, maybe you want to get up, who... Um, Dr. Krauss came and, and sort of volunteered to look a little bit of the American collection, but he's become already now, he's here um, on a daily basis and, and really deals with all inquiries and research and other things, and he's going to give a presentation. And then perhaps a little more surprising to, to some of you who know, recognize Frank L. Kovacs, of course, um, Frank, better known as a, in the ancient field, um, his, his position is curatorial associate of American military orders and decorations, <laughs> um, which is his new um, field of speciality. He's very active. Um, he was here last week and he can't be here and he continues to live in California but comes on regular visits and deals with the collection. 
Um, this is really wonderful to have such volunteer work and, and um, you know, this enthusiasm um, to help the ANS. And uh, it's, it's clear, you know, we acknowledge the help of people, members, collectors and dealers, um, what they can bring to the field. Um, we have our very academic staff, but then we have people that we, um, like Eric and Frank, who um, bring an enormous amount. So now I'm going to hand over. Um, for uh, the director of the uh, development, Eshel is going to give her report. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uta. Um, I just want to say it's uh, a privilege to be here and it's a privilege for me to work at the ANS. Um, and it's nice to see everybody here today. Um, I want to start just uh, to say that I may repeat a number of things that have already been said today as I deal with the financial and membership aspects of the organization, so please forgive me, but I actually want to start um, by telling you a little bit about um, a new face of membership and fundraising department. Um, Emma Pratt, she doesn't usually walk around with a helmet on, but I hope that you will please say hello to her. And I don't see her, in, oh, Emma, would you stand up? So, um, she's our, she's our <laughs> I don't know if you can see what she did. Um, Emma uh, took over from Catherine DeTori in early June. And although she's new to the, the membership department, she's actually almost a veteran at the society. She's worked here since July 2014 as a photographer digitizing the ancient Greek and Roman coinage for ochre, the RBW collection, and most recently the Hellenistic Royal Coinages Project. She brings many wonderful attributes uh, to this department, not least of which are her photographic and artistic skills um, as evident here on this slide, as well as in the annual report that I hope you all have a copy of, and if you don't, there are more in the back of the room there. Um, we were sorry to see Catherine DeTuri leave. Uh, she took a position closer to her home in Connecticut, but we're very happy to have Emma here, and um, please know that she's your go-to person for questions regarding membership and any other related uh, matters. Um, I just want to thank you again. Uh, this, uh, the ANS is, I think, really fortunate to have such a dedicated group of members and your generosity was uh, really demonstrated again this uh, fiscal year. Um, as previously said, the Society received more than a million three hundred thousand in donations, um, most of which were for general support and that in addition to that was another 200,000 or so in um, membership dues. Um, one of our goals this year was to make it a little bit easier for us and also for you to renew. And so we uh, offered the opportunity for you to, remove, to renew your dues for two years. Um, and 25% of our members, in fact, elected to do that this year. So that's 25% uh, fewer people we have to go after. And it also gives us a little boost uh, financially in deferred income for fiscal 2018. Um, you support us in a variety of other ways. Um, on the left there, you see photos from our gala this year. Um, we uh, uh, were fortunate to receive about $170,000 towards the gala. Um, we welcomed over 150 friends at the Waldorf Historia to honor um, Anthony Terranova, who's here today, and also the um, Eric B. Newman Numismatic Education Society and the Newman Numismatic Portal. So we thank all of you who were able to attend and who donated to that event. That was our last event uh, being held at the Waldorf, which is now closed for renovations. So I'm pleased to report that in 2018, the annual gala dinner will be held a few blocks away from the Waldorf at the Harvard Club. And that will be on Thursday, January 11th. We're also pleased to announce that the 
trustees uh, award will go to the Rosen family and more information about that event will be available in the next week or so. In addition to uh, all this support for the society, we also have um, long-term support in the form of the campaign to endow the chair of the executive director. There's the chair. Um, and <laughs> we have, uh, this year we brought in uh, $252,000 for that chair that brings our total um, in hand of almost a million dollars of the million four hundred thousand that's been raised uh, so far. I just want to emphasize um, that the ANS really and truly appreciates all gifts regardless of the size of the donation. Um, it's really not the amount of the gift that's important to us. It's, it's equally important the breadth of support that's demonstrated and for this um, widespread commitment to our mission. It represents something critically important as it influences and attracts further giving from foundations and other sources. So we're deeply grateful to all of you for no matter what you're able to contribute in whatever form. And without that support um, from dues and from donations, I think the ANS would really not be able to do all the projects um, that they're currently doing, nor initiate uh, new ones. So thank you. Um, there, um, our goal to increase membership involvement um, has been spoken about a little bit. I just want to um, get off topic for a moment and just talk about the Sage Society, which is um, a group that um, gives a yearly donation of $2,500. And one of the benefits uh, for that group are these annual trips abroad. Uh, this year, um, a group of SAGE members um, spent 10 days traveling throughout Spain. And you can read about that trip in an upcoming uh, edition of the ANS magazine. Next June, members will have the opportunity to travel to the Republic of Georgia, which should be quite an experience and uh, unusual, a little off the beaten track. Um, for those of you who might not have the time or the inclination to take these trips abroad but might be interested in joining the SAGE Society, we are going to um, begin organizing shorter excursions to places of interest in the United States and more information on that will also be forthcoming. Um, I just want to note that we were pleased to welcome six new SAGE members this year. Uh, some join to go on these trips and others join simply as a way to um, increase their commitment and donation to the society. Um, the other thing we've talked about today are the money talks. Um, I won't go over that again except to say that the topics were very far-ranging, including um, origin of money, the beginnings of Islamic coinage, the ever popular, the art of photographing coins that our Alan Rocha uh, held and will do again in the spring. Um, upcoming talks in November, the numismatic, numismatic book collecting and wine and coins to be held in December. I keep thinking it should be wine and chocolate coins, but um, uh, I, don't, I don't know if that will be the case. Um, the Money Talks lecture series is actually in addition to our other funded lectures, which continue to be extremely popular events, uh, featuring some of our most distinguished colleagues, including last October, Dr. Andrew Burnett, who spoke earlier today, who presented the Mark M. Salton Memorial Lecture. In May, Dr. Philip Wagoner, Professor of Art History and Archaeology at Wellesleyan University, <coughs> presented the 2017 Harry W. Fowler Memorial Lecture. And in September, we also had um, Anarin Ellis Evans, who's a lecturer in ancient history at Oxford, present um, a lecture. So these are all opportunities for you to come visit us here and socialize and um, participate. And we'd love to see you if possible. Otherwise, many of these are available on YouTube for your viewing. And finally, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about planned giving. Um, we have a long-term ongoing effort to formalize and make better known our planned giving program. 
This program has been operating a bit under the radar in the past, but we hope to change that this coming year. Fortunately for us, even without intensified efforts, many ANS members are quite passionate about the need to create a legacy for future generations, and they have already done so <laughs> and continue to do so in a variety of ways. Uh, two recent examples, Uta already mentioned Catherine Bulawa moore um, who uh, was a long-term supporter and member since 1955, an honorary life fellow, and she left us a gift um, which surprised and touched us um, specifically designated for support for our library. And most recently, another um, member, Robert Bartlett, who was a member since 1981, who um, sadly passed away, but he left us his collection of approximately 400 coins, which he meticulously cataloged in the ledger, which Uta and others are going to be picking up, uh, I guess, in the next couple of weeks. So these are just uh, two examples of ways you can leave a legacy and support uh, to support the future of the society. Um, I just want to close with a quote. We received a letter from somebody who, uh, one of our members and big supporters who told us that he has decided to name us in his will. And he writes, quote, I look forward to naming the ANS in our wills and agree that a concerted effort should be made to obtain more such pledges, pledges. Giving after one is gone is a lot less painful than when alive. <laughs> <laughs> this is a quote. Though I do hope to do some, quote, alive giving too. <laughs> so I and we, we wish all of you here and all of our members a long and healthy life. But there are many ways you can help keep the joy of numismatics alive for future scholars and enthusiasts. If you'd like to find out more, how you can make a planned gift to the ANS, please let us know. I'd love to talk to you. And thank you so much. I'd like to welcome David Hill. OK. Thank you, Michelle. OK. I'd like to start by talking about the Newman uh, Numismatic Portal and our ongoing collaboration with it. Uh, we're making ANS's print and manuscript collections available throughout the world and uh, uh, to scholars and numismatists um, throughout the world uh, on the internet. So this year we said goodbye to John Grafeo, who has been digitizing these materials since the project began in 2015. I'm happy to say that he will continue with the Newman Portal um, as a consultant working with the Mint Records at the National Archives in Denver. And we wish him the best of luck, he and his wife, as they pursue the rest of their career there. This fall, we welcomed Laura Jacobs, Laura Jacobs, actually, who has taken over where John left off. She has a degree in library science and previous experience digitizing collections. So overall, about 2,000 items from the ANS library have gone online in the past year. And there are nearly 5,000 now available, mostly US auction catalogs. And to date, the focus has mainly been on US auction catalogs. And now, thanks to a software enhancement that was funded by a personal donation by uh, the Newman Portal coordinator, Len Augsburger, nearly all of these scans can now be obtained directly from the ANS online catalog donum. So to give a sense of how this works here, uh, we have a link now in all of our records. This is one from uh, a Kogan sale, I believe, of 1859. And it will link directly to uh, the Newman Portal. Okay, along with the auction catalogs, we've been adding other materials, including some from the ANS archives. This spring, eight boxes of records from the New Netherlands Coin Company were scanned and made available on the Internet Archive and the Newman Portal. Other archival materials have been added as well, scans of two of the ANS's most important collections, uh, those of Virgil Brand of Chicago and the Garrets of Baltimore, also went online. So, okay, here's a picture of them uh, as they are in the room. And then here we are on the uh, Internet Archive. Again, uh, you see these uh, various notebooks of Virgil Brand. And then they link uh, to the actual content that can be downloaded and read online. Also, the Garrett files, these are mostly uh, folders, but there are index cards. So you choose a folder. <coughs> and then you can page through these uh, folders of uh, correspondence documenting their collection. 
Okay, so in preparing the Garrett collection for scanning, I came across a group of letters from the Dutch coin dealer Hans Schulman to John Garrett, who was a car career diplomat with ties to the State Department. And these became the basis for an article that I wrote for ANS Magazine. And in the letters, uh, Hans had sought Garrett's assistance in getting his father, Moritz, and his mother and sister out of the Netherlands during World War II. Unfortunately, all efforts were unsuccessful, and Moritz and his wife were sent to an extermination camp. Now, coincidentally, while working on this article, uh, I happened to, a uh, folder of materials came across my desk having to do with the Dutch World War I medal and poster collector Maurice Frankenhaus, who along with his family was also sent to a concentration camp, though they survived. Uh, I, was, I got in touch with his grandson, Aaron Oppenheim, and he made his grandfather's archives and artifacts available to me, and the result was another article for the magazine. Oops, too far, okay. Uh, the ANS is also working with the Newman portal to have the entire run of the publication Coin World scanned by Internet Archive. A large portion of this is being funded by ANS member Beth, Beth Deicher, who is with us today. Uh, so thank you, Beth, um, who was the Coin, uh, Coin World editor from 1985 to 2012. <coughs> Progress is well underway with nearly 700 issues scanned so far. In the spring, another sale of ANS's duplicate uh, auction catalogs took place in collaboration with the Classical Numismatics Group. As always, there was a lot of preliminary work involved, listing and compi comparing copies and scanning covers and packaging and labeling. And this sale brought a hammer total of over $4,000 for 102, 122 catalogs. There have been some exciting acquisitions in the past year, ANS member Michael Sullivan donated a collection of rare banknote reporters and counterfeit detection publications dating from the 1830s to the 1890s, many housed in his own custom-made archival boxes. And one welcome acquisition was accepted with a touch of sadness. These were the research files of our friend and colleague, Rick Wyshanke, who died in 2015. We've been processing these fi uh, boxes of files on Roman Republican and provincial coinage, knowing how important they'll be to scholars in the future. The library also acquired a bound volume of three pamphlets from uh, artist and engraver Augustine Dupre, known for his work on French coins and for his design of early U.S. medals. This volume is from Dupre's own library and date from the time of the French Revolution. We'd like to thank ANS fellow uh, David Gladfelter for contributing to the purchase of this volume. The ANS also acquired a group of letters from the 1890s through the 1920s to add to its existing collection of correspondence of the Tiffany gemologist and coin reform advocate George Frederick Kuntz. The ANS Kuntz collection, as, along with another one held by the American Museum of Natural History, uh, formed the foundation for another article that I wrote, this one focusing on Kuntz's uh, decades-long advocacy for the <coughs> improvement of U.S. coinage. It's always a pleasure to talk about the ANS's historical collections, and I had the opportunity to do so in June when I spoke at the New York Numismatic Club about transportation collector Bernard Morgenthau, whose papers and token collection are held by the ANS. We're grateful to all of those who donate books and time and funding for the library, so I'd like to mention a few whose ongoing support deserves special mention. Over the years, George Kuhay, whom most of you know, as editor of the standard catalog of world coins and paper uh, and world paper money, ensured that the ANS received all of the catalogs published. He's no longer there, but he was still able this year to get some of the copies for us. Uh, Whitman publishes numerous books each year, and we have Dennis Tucker to thank for always ensuring that we get a copy of each one they publish. Thanks to the generosity of the Armenian Numismatic Society, we have a larger section, perhaps, devoted to this area than might be expected. And researcher and collector Pete Smith continues to help us fill in our gaps in our auction catalog collection. Uh, yearly, he's been sending these to us, and uh, the materials that we receive daily require constant attention, and along with our part-time cataloger, James Woodstock, we're happy to have the assistance of several interns and volunteers who joined us this year. This is Harriet Williams, a library school student at Pratt, who's done some archival work at the New York Botanical Garden. Marcella Tam studied library science at Pratt Institute and has worked with the library and archival materials at the Brooklyn Museum and the New York Public Library. Lisa Hanna is a graduate of the library school program at Queens College and is working with our auction catalogs and pamphlet files. 
Lisa Bernard is getting her library science degree at the Palmer School and has a background in retail museum and art book sales. And Christopher Lee, who is with us here today, is a graduate of Sotheby's Institute of Art. He traveled from his home in China to study in the United States, and he is an ANS member with an interest in ancient Western coins. He helped us by cataloging uh, the Far Eastern books that once belonged to ANS treasurer and collector John Riley, and I might mention that there is a small exhibit outside in the rare book room of these books. He's been producing uh, records using both Roman and Chinese characters and also cataloging in English and using the pinyin style. So here's an example of the work that he's been doing, uh, aided greatly by the Encyclopedia of Chinese Coins. Uh, as always, I had a hard time, I certainly couldn't fit this on one slide. I want to thank so many people for contributing to the library and sending us their publications. This is just one slide and I have another and I could barely get them on two this year. So this seems to grow every year, I'm happy to say. Mm -hmm. So thank you to everybody that supports the library in funding and by volunteering and by donating books and other materials. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Andrew Reinhardt, our Director of Publications. Hello, everyone. Unlike our books, I will be brief. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, <laughs> there, now you laugh, thank you. <laughs> Which way do I go? Here we are. Um, actually, this is partially true. Uh, we have two books coming out in November and December that are quite short, one by Bill Metcalf and one by Andrew Burnett and Richard Simpson and Deborah Thorpe, um, some on Elizabethan coinage and numismatics, and another on proconsular cystophori. So uh, with that being said, what did we do last year? Um, we have uh, a number of books. Um, I hope you all have purchased your copy of Wolfgang Fischer Bossert's uh, Opus Magnum, Coins, Artists, and Tyrants, um, Syracuse in the Time of the Peloponnesian War. It is well worth the coin. Um, <laughs> with the <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'll be here all week, folks. Um, I, I think. No more jokes. No <laughs> with the Colonial Newsletter, uh, we did have a change in editorship. Uh, it is now being edited by Christopher McDowell. He's a lawyer at, in Cincinnati, and I think he spends more time on the newsletter than he does at work, uh, which is great for us at the ANS. So if you've noticed a change in content, and especially length, um, you know, pick up a copy of the CNL or subscribe. Um, with uh, ANS Magazine, we did, again, four issues. Uh, thank you to Peter Van Alphen for your excellent editorship uh, and uh, for the others who have been participating in uh, you know, the editing and publication of this. And then for the American Junior Journal of Numismatics, we have one that is getting ready for press. Um, you all have probably seen volume 28 now. Uh, thank you to Udo Wartenberg and to David Yoon for their editorship of that volume. Uh, we won stuff this year, um, if you haven't heard already, from the Newman, uh, excuse me, uh, lots of Newman numismatic stuff going on, but this is from the Numismatic Literary Guild. Um, the uh, Art of Devastation exhibition catalog um, won for best book on uh, 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 metals, and John Connolly's book, Irritamenta, uh, won for best world money book uh, at the NLG, at the World's Fair of Money this year. So thanks to both of them. Um, speaking of Art of, Art of Devastation, um, one of the things that will be coming out in the upcoming e-news, and you might have already gotten a press release on this, is that uh, we've partnered with the uh, Getty Cultural Institute for online exhibitions. And so the first one, our test bed project, is this, Art of Devastation. You can go through and you can actually see everything that was on exhibit. Um, you know, there, and, y and you'll be able to follow the link from e-news that's coming out. Um, as far as digital publications are concerned, I wanted to thank Ethan Gruber and uh, Desnarda um, for putting together um, this particular feature, Identify a Coin, which is part of Ochre, and uh, Gilles might be uh, speaking on this in a little bit, but it's a great idea. Uh, we have all of the Roman emperors here. You can, s you can swipe through and look at these things visually as you go in order to do image-based searching and get information there. Um, also, we received um, uh, a second grant uh, for the second year of um, the Humanities Open Book Project. And uh, this is from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in cooperation with the National Endowment of Humanities, Office of Digital Humanities, um, in order to completely scan and make available uh, online for free as open access all of our monographs dating up to around 2012. So thank you to them. And at this point, I would like to hand off to my friend and colleague and Scotch buddy, uh, Peter Van Alphen. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, I think we need a little bit more Scotch. Um, 
Curatorial department activities. <coughs> so a few days ago, I asked uh, Emma Pratt if she would shoot a photo of the curatorial staff lineup. And um, given the uh, little bit of time that we all had to prepare ourselves for this, I think it, the photo turned out quite nicely. And you'll be hearing from uh, most of the people uh, in this photo momentarily on their activities and projects um, this year. But what I'd like to focus on right now are the activities of the group in total as, 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 a, as a collective. Uh, Uta already mentions that uh, Vivek left earlier this year, actually just uh, about a month ago, and um, I'd like to just reiterate um, how sad we are to see him go, wish him the best of luck in the pursuit of his PhD in London, um, and thank him for the great amount of work that he was able to do on, um, on the Islamic section while he was here, the Islamic and actually South Asian sections as well. Uh, and I would also really like to extend a, a tremendous welcome and heartfelt thanks to both Eric Krauss and Frank Kovacs for all that they've been doing uh, in the last little while, uh, um, the last couple of months, uh, as, as they've been spending time here and with the collection. Both of them have uh, made tremendous inroads into various sections and have really accomplished a lot. So again, I'd really just like to extend thanks to them and I'm very much looking forward to um, spending time with them in, in the coming years. <laughs> Um, so once, once again this year, a great deal of our curatorial efforts collectively have been spent trying to enhance your experience online with our search database Mantis. Uh, those of you who have spent any time with Mantis, I'm sure, have run into problems with it. Um, a lot of this has to do with the fact that over the course of uh, a couple of generations now, the database that lies behind Mantis has seen a lot of hands work on it. All good effort, I have to say. There, this is not to disparage anybody's work on this. It's just simply that there wasn't a lot of effort to standardize the work that was going into it. And therefore, um, when you go into Mantis currently um, to try to find things, you're not always successful. So a great deal of our time right now, in fact, every Tuesday morning we are having a curatorial group meeting to sit down and work through sections of this, is to standardize, regularize as much of this database that lies behind Mantis as possible to enhance your ability to find material and to have this accurately described. And in fact, um, if you were here this last weekend for the Money Talks lecture on the future of digitization here at the ANS, you would have heard uh, some of this in detail, and this now is posted on our YouTube site, so I would encourage you to go take a look at that uh, video or that series of videos from last weekend if you're interested in the de details of this. Um, part of this effort also is to increase the number of photographs of material in the collection online. And once again, uh, Emma and Alan Roche have added a substantial number of, of new images to the database. And so we are now um, well over 157,000 images uh, in linked up to the database, which represents about 25% of the collection. Uh, and you'll see that over the course of this last year, we've seen some tremendous increases in both the Greek and the Roman side of the photography. And this really has to do with the fact that we've had a, a concerted push on these two sections, thanks to uh, both Ochre and the Hellenus Agrola Coinage Project. We've, we've been able to um, have Emma uh, f focus um, specifically on photographing material for that while Alan has concentrated on uh, some other uh, uh, areas of the collection. Now, in addition to Mantis and enhancing your experience there, we also have been spending a lot of our time as well working on this suite of digital projects. Uh, Gilles will be talking about um, Ochre, which uh, wrapped up, or at least the funding, the NEH funding for Ochre wrapped up a little bit earlier this year. And he will be uh, talking about um, how we hit all of our milestones with that, and then some. But we also were um, thrilled to receive another NEH grant to fund Hellenistic Royal Coinages, just as we um, were tapering off with Ochre. Uh, you can read about uh, the details of Hellenistic Royal Coinages in a blog post on our Pocket Change blog uh, from back in uh, March, March 29th actually. Uh, but uh, essentially what this is, is a project that will link a number of uh, specific sites, um, Pella, which has been up now for a few years, dedicated to the coinage of Alexander III, Alexander the Great, 
as well as a, another <coughs> separate site devoted to Seleucid coins and yet another site devoted specifically to Ptolemaic coins. This will then be linked through an umbrella site called Hellenistic Royal Coinages, which will allow you to go in and search across these various sites or to work specifically on <coughs> one coinage or another. Uh, these sites will also be enhanced ultimately by um, FindSpot tools linked to coinhoards.org, our um, online presentation of uh, the inventory of uh, Greek coin hoards and coin hoards, as well as ultimately a tool that will allow you to go in and search by monograms. Um, as most of you know, or um, uh, I hope know, uh, a lot of Hellenistic coins are very talkative. They, they have a lot of monograms, a lot of symbols on them. And in order to find what you're looking for on some of these coins sometimes, it's best if you can search by monogram. So we will ultimately be able to present that to you as a search function. Now, we are very close, um, just weeks away, in fact, from launching Seleucid coins online. And as we do that, we will then launch the umbrella site, Hellenistic Royal Coinages, as well. So um, we're, we're just uh, a matter of weeks away from that, um, just a, a matter of trying to get the last little details in our database and so forth um, ironed out, and we will announce that when we're ready. This year, once again, the curatorial staff in Toto has been hugely productive and prolific. Uh, we collectively produced three books, 28 articles and chapters, and presented at 21 conferences, or, or at least gave 21 conference presentations, and there was a little bit of overlap there. Uh, you can find uh, our more recent publications as well as backlog of publications on our various academia.edu sites. And um, in addition to the publication th or research thrust, we, we also are hugely committed to education. Uh, as Utsa mentioned, we have been bringing in a number of uh, grade school groups, uh, which Lucia Carboni has been organizing. And um, some of us have also been teaching um, courses at local universities as well as giving guest lectures in local universities as well. But our primary focus remains uh, the Eric P. Newman Summer Gra Graduate Seminar, which again this year was held in June and July. Uh, this year, again, we welcomed eight students from around the country as well as around the world, as well as Thomas Fauché as our visiting scholar. And um, yet again, Alan Roche came up with a brilliant concept, in fact, I think helped by Uta, um, for a class photo. Um, and thankfully, we had some, some th this sort of retro photograph was helped, I think, in part by the fact that some of our students had 19th century facial hair, <laughs> as you can see here. <laughs> um, in, in terms of uh, exhibits, uh, we, you know, haven't, uh, or we, we, we've taken parts in, uh, or collectively, we, we've um, uh, um, presented this, this small exhibit out here in the hallway, which I hope you'll have a chance to take a look at, uh, which uh, recently um, we, we installed the recent acquisitions, Elena did, for um, 2016 and 2017. But uh, earlier this year, we, we were able to um, uh, partner with Vassar College with the Loeb, uh, Francis Lehman Loeb uh, Art Center there to put on Art of Devastation. Um, now, while this exhibit is now history, um, as Andrew mentioned, uh, it lives on on the Google Cultural Institute. And thanks to Andrew's efforts, this really is a tremendous um, uh, uh, display of, of this, uh, of this um, material in virtual reality, and I do <coughs> hope that you'll take a look at that. So I'd like now to turn this over to Elena, who will um, talk about new acquisitions and um, other materials. So thank you. Good evening. As you can see, no, yet. Uh, this fiscal year, NSCO and Cabinet continue to acquire various interesting objects. And we would like to express our deep appreciation and acknowledge the following donors and vendors for their assistance in helping us to enrich the NS collections with new, interesting, and important objects. Here are just some highlights. 
Our holding of Roman provincial Peloponnesian coins were filled by a generous donation from the remarkable BCD collection given to us by the NS executive director, Ute Wartenberg Kegen. Among the very rare items received are a bronze Diasarian of Geta from Sison, an extremely rare Assarian uh, of this emperor from the Cyparisi in Messenia that does not appear in standard reference catalogues. Other examples in this gift include the coins of Caracalla from Pylos and Laconian Githium, and very rare issue of Septimius Severus from the Arcadian Mint, Orchomenus, which is unpublished obverse type of the emperor. A group of 980 bronze coins of the Roman provincial Spain from the former collection of Archer Huntington and HSA was generously contributed by Ken Adlow, chairman of the board of trustee. Most of the examples are struck in the name of Augustus and Tiberius and issued at numerous Spanish mint as Betica, Taraconensis, and Lusitania. We are also grateful for another large gift from Ken Adlow to the medieval department. This group of 802 examples, also from the former Huntington collection, and consists mostly of coins of two kings of Castile and Leon, Sancho IV and Ferdinand IV, and one non-Castilian coin, a dinero of Ramon Berenger from Girona. A significant gift from the Edlo family fund, which we talked today about very great generosity, is a group of 187 Visigothic coins from the former HSA collection. Highlights include coins from many of less common mints, as well as kind of Udila, as King only know from his coins, and a coin of Roderick, the last of the Visigothic king in Toledo. Along with previous donation from the Ken Edlow Fund, this donation, these Visigothic coins elevated uh, our collection to the largest in the world, not only in the United States, but in the world. An important donation of, uh, to our Byzantine collection came from ANS member Spira Kines. It's a four pentanumia uh, produced in Kherson, it's Byzantine mint Kherson, in Crimea, Ukraine, <laughs> you should know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, still Ukraine. This issue, previously lacking in our cabinet, display the imperial couple, Justin the Second and Elia Sophia on the obverse, and show Tiberius beside the large letter Delta on the reverse. The coin appeared at time of Justin the Second after 574, when General Tiberius, its future Gen uh, Tiberius the Second Constantine Emperor, was elevated to the rank of Caesar. We never get this coin in our collection. Our South Asian department acquired an interesting group of coins from pre-Islamic period Herzmia and Arakan from the famous collection of a German diplomat Hans Mondorf. <laughs> we also are grateful to have been given a group of Islamic coins from our trustee Jerry Beckrack. The core of this donation is a group of the coins of Ayubid and Ilhanid dynasties of Syria and Iran. It's very important to get this. We don't have them also in our collection. We are quite grateful to have received from longtime ANS member in Hawaii, Donald Canapara, group of Mexican copper Achuales. These historical artifacts were made in Western Mexico from around 1200 until the Spanish conquest in the 1520s. The NS Latin American collection has been enriched with a Peruvian eight realist of 1832 with a Philippines counter stamp of Ferdinand VII of Spain. This interesting piece from the former collection of the Hispanic Society was previously on long time loan to NS. Several years ago, as you probably remember, the long loan was withdrawn and sold at auction, but however, at has returned to the collection as a gift from our member, Kyle Panteria. The NS fellow and benefactor, Anthony Terranova, generously donated a pair of dice by Victor Brenner, produced for a placket 
of Charlotte May Buffett Smith in 1910. This placket was commissioned by her husband, Eric Smith, who intended to perpetuate a devoted memory for his untimely deceased wife. Anthony Terranova also donated a 22 carat gold coin, gold medal, commemorative medal. This example was commissioned by a prominent Italian opera tenor, Enrica Caruso, from New York Tiffany, and was given to Pasquale Simonelli, a banker and Caruso's New York impresario, who negotiated the singer first contract with the Metropolitan Opera in 1903. An exciting gift to our United States Department became the American Liberty 225th anniversary $10 gold coin of 2017, which was generously donated by the NS trustee Mary Lennon. This coin of 24 karat gold is produced in high relief and in the obverse liberty is shown as a woman with African-American features and instead of traditional laurel wreaths for her crown, this liberty wears a crown of stars. The NS is extremely grateful to add such a beautiful example of recent U.S. currency, the first in the Celebrating Liberty series. Another aspect of our curatorial department activities is the NS Museum Loan Program. Currently, around 400 objects are out on loan to permanent and temporary exhibitions, and as usually, curatorial staff provide consultation service and help with installation to the borrowing institutions. Here are some recent highlights. In March, an interesting exhibit called New York Crystal Palace, 1853, opened at the Bart Graduate Center in New York City. Shedding light on a nearly forgotten aspect of New York cultural history, it explored a first world fair held in the United States. Five objects from the UNS, uh, from the NS were requested for this exhibit. Among them, their, uh, their uh, commemorated medal depicting a crystal palace and a silver award medal from the exhibition. In April, a new cultural institution, New Museum of the American Revolution, was opened in Philadelphia downtown. For their inaugural exhibit, the NS lent 12 18th century medals. Two of these are the earliest Indian Peace Medal known, a British bronze medal of George I, and a French silver medal with Louis XV on the others. Another remarkable medal in this group was issued at the time of Pontiac's revolt in 1763. On the obverse of this medal is an image of George III. The reverse depicts an American of, uh, Indian and a British officer sitting on the bench and smoking a pipe of peace. Very peaceful. Also among KNS items on loan is a group of Admiral Vernon medals, also which we have in our collection. At the beginning of September, interesting exhibition called Antinous, the Emperor's Beloved, investigating a Roman portrait, was opened at the San Antonio Museum of Art in Texas. The exhibit is inspired by one of the museum's masterpieces, a marble head of Antinous, the beautiful youth beloved by the Roman Emperor Hadrian. Among the objects loaned from the NS for this show is a bronze coins from Berutus featuring on the reverse a statue of Dionysus in the same resting pose as San Antonio Museum's marble portrait. Another NS coin from the Cilician Mint of Tarsus portrait Antinous wearing a miniature Egyptian ham-ham chrome. It's very elaborate chrome for gods. Also in September, a remarkable exhibit opened at Yeshiva University Museum in New York. This exhibit entitled The Arch of Titus from Jerusalem to Rome and back explores the Arch of Titus in Rome through its original and involving cultural context. For this show, the NS selected a group of 33 notable coins. These include coins minted by Jewish rebels during the early years of first Jewish revolt against Rome. Other NS coins in exhibit minted by the Flavian emperors after the Roman sack of the Jerusalem temple feature a range of allegorical, like Judea Capta, 
and historical images of Flavian emperors celebrating the Flavian's victory. Among the ancient Judean coins in this exhibit is an example minted under Metitas Antigonus, the last king and high priest of the Maccabean dynasty. It bears a rare Jewish visual expression of the temple menorah, here, I don't know, if, yeah, you can see probably, and a table of the showbread, which are also shown being carried by Roman soldiers on the Arch of Titus bas relief in Rome. In conclusion, I would like to take a moment and express again our sincere thanks to the curatorial department's very valuable volunteer. Among them, of course, Ken Edlo, like it was mentioned, he helped us to supervise our visitors. Eric Krause, who from beginning worked on the various projects in our US department. We want to acknowledge Emeritus Curator Robert Hogg for his continued substantial involvement with the society. We are also glad that Frank Kovac, during his visitors to New York, has started to reorganize the society military decoration, as Ute mentioned. Our longtime volunteer and devoted friend, Ted Whittington, also helped with this military decoration project. We must also thank Ted Whittington for his priceless, absolutely priceless work with our Chinese collection. We thank them all for their generous assistance with many curatorial functions. Okay. Lastly, in conjunction with this, with this meeting, the NS curatorial staff has installed in our entrance gallery a display of new acquisitions. We hope you will enjoy it and that it will encourage you to make interesting donation mm -hmm. to our collection during coming year. Thank you. <laughs> now my colleague, Gilles Brownsburg will continue this presentation. Good afternoon, and thank you for being here on a, on a Saturday afternoon. So I should do this. Good. Um, that was quite an active year, so I had a luxury of topics I could uh, think of, and I, I'll try to focus on some of them. Um, starting by Orker, which is something you have uh, heard about. So it's a kind of... I'm careful to say, I don't want to say mission accomplished because it could be bad memories uh, from recent political history. But let's say that we fulfilled our mission and now it's not over, obviously, because people write to us, find mistakes, and there are new functionalities we could think about implementing. Um, so it's going to be an ongoing process, unfortunately, without the funding of NEH anymore, but we, we have some, uh, we will dedicate some time to, to it. Um, so th these are some of the numbers which are um, quite impressive because now we have 110,000 uh, phys physical coins which allow to illustrate 43,000 types of Romanian imperial coins, which is a coverage ratio of about 50%. Obviously, if you do the math, you find out that sometimes some types are represented by more than one coin. Actually, I found some solidity of the late 4th century with up to 230 distinct coins, which make people think that maybe some dice studies may be doable soon based on occur. Regarding the contribution collections, that's the point on which I would like to focus because it's, it's live, ongoing and increasing, especially due to uh, what Ethan Gruber is doing on, uh, on that collaborative side. So we at the Munich Cabinet in Berlin, the British Museum, which is the first contributor in terms of number of coins. Um, and I'd like to say one word about this one, the portable antiquity scheme. Right now it's about 900 coins. In reality, they have something like 300 or 400,000 Roman coins that in their database and growing every day. Basically, there are more coins discovered in Britain than anywhere else in the former Roman Empire. So you may think that the Rome was run from Britain. Um, the reality is that British legislation is extremely favorable 
to uh, people looking for coins with, with metal detector. Whereas in France, Italy, and other very smart countries, um, a discovered coin belonged to the state. So result is people find very few coins, obviously. So um, I'm very happy that the portable antiquity scheme is part of our curve. We'll bring more coins uh, as time goes by, and it's going to be a very important contribution to Ocker. So now in terms of uh, web traffic, as you see, it's increasing. I mean, we're not going to compete with Wikipedia. Uh, Roman numismatic remain, um, an, well, a topic of knowledge which, not, which is not shared by zillions of people, but still, uh, it's a growing uh, traffic from many different countries um, in many different languages as well. Um, you see German, Italian, Spanish, French, Bulgarian come up quite nicely uh, since Ocker is available in many languages. Yes. So Money Talks. Um, money Talks was something I, I remember like back in 2012, my wife Olivia, uh, Uta, Jonathan, myself had a kind of discussion or should we be more social, open up, and, and then it went into a sleeping mode for, for a few years and suddenly was resurrected. And I it had become one of the huge success this year of VNS, as well as something very enjoyable. We, we take pleasure of being here on, on, on Saturdays and meeting people. I'm, yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> <laughs> I will not be here. <laughs> it's, it's a pleasant thing to do, see members in a more relaxed fashion, have more time, uh, and discuss on topics we, we like. And um, so we started a few, a few months ago, but already members are um, pretty nice. And um, yes, as you see here, we've had more than 150 attendees uh, since February se uh, 17. There are some double accounting. Some people come more than once. But we must have about 120, 130 different uh, uh, attendees since the beginning, which is nice, a nice coverage ratio for the population of the ANS on the Eastern Coast. So. Um, here, I'd like to say something about Latin America. I started to get involved with the Latin American department uh, a few months ago, and instead of doing something theoretical about what we could do, I'd like to take one example that will illustrate the value and the potential of the NS uh, collection in that field. Some time ago, um, I came across an interesting history. That history was, um, well, initially, so the, the Spaniards came here, or Mexico and Peru discovered gold and, and, and silver, but there was no mint. So ingots were sent to Spain to be struck in, in, uh, in Sevilla or Cadiz and sent back to Latin America, which was absurd. Actually, we have some of these ingots here, so quite big objects. So at some point, the authorities decided to mint coins in Mexico, and the decision was taken in 1535. And silver coins between a quarter real and uh, tres reales were authorized. However, uh, the, the two real and the three real are very close because it's only 50% more silver. So on a weight basis, it may be 50% heavier, but on a module basis, it's barely bigger. So locals were fooled by some unscrupulous colonials. And uh, the authorities in Mexico uh, decided to withdraw the three real S coin, and there was a rule decision in November 1537. Um, as you see, that was a very short period of, uh, of issuance. So as a result, there were very few of these coins minted, and most of them were withdrawn and melted. So I looked into the collection and found we had some of them, and then went into the, liter the available literature on that topic. Um, in 1950, Prado, in his Historia de Mathematica de Mexico, uh, thought about uh, only three coins, and the ANS had one at that time. But his, his research was sort of outdated because five years later, Robert Nesmith, published by VNS actually, in NS Monograph, 1955, find five distinct types with 11 coins, three of them with VNS. Unfortunately, we, one of them is HSA coin. So during that time, uh, Anderson gave one coin to the ANS, and the HSA coin catalogued here was sold. So I tried to trace the, the destiny of that coin, um, the uh, HSA coin. So that, that these are the ANS coins, the three reales we have. So the HSA coin uh, was sold in 2012 through the global sales by Sotheby's and resurfaced in 2013 with Morton and Eden. 
It sold for 2,220 pounds. What struck me here was we have 11 coins like that worldwide. These coins are almost 500 years old. Uh, imagine they, are, they were copper, you know, US early copper. Uh, they would have a much higher price. They're much more ancient, they are in silver. The number of existing coins is very rare. It's a type that was discontinued. It's the first coins ever minted in America, in the American continent. It's telling you about the, the potential we have uh, of more development in this section of uh, the, uh, the NS uh, collection, the Latin American department. So I'll go faster now with the end, which is more, more expected. So we participate in con shows, education. These topics have been already mentioned before. So these are some of the children we hosted here. That was fun, and we have more of them uh, soon. Uh, talking about education, we had some specific training about uh, uh, tablecloth folding and unfolding. You may recognize some uh, NS uh, trustees and members on this one. That's Baltimore a few months ago. Um, lectures, publication, conferences. The topic was uh, mentioned by Peter. We're pretty active uh, in that field. Uh, so th these are some of the stuff I published with uh, what I think was the main thing we did at VNS for Michel Amandry, both you know, Peter, Uta, myself contributed to this volume to Michel, and Michel was extremely pleased, uh, and with Andrew Burnett as well as a co-editor, so that was a very ANS thing, uh, that publication, uh, other articles or conferences, and uh, I thank you for your attention. <laughs>
The main project that Kara worked on during her semester with us was cataloging our 19th century Irish tokens. One of my major responsibilities is the American Journal of Numismatics. As co-editor, I have been working to improve the representation of medieval, modern, and non-Western numismatics in the journal. Although unfortunately no articles on topics relating to the Americas were received for volume 29, I am pleased that there will be several articles pertaining to medieval, modern, and Asian topics. I hope that this diversity will continue and uh, possibly increase in future issues. Two of these articles represent my own research on medieval coinage. The first, co-authored with Peter Bartlett and Ruth Pliego, is primarily a presentation of Bartlett's work on the standards of weight and fineness in pre-regal Visigothic coinage. My contribution to this article consists of stylistic studies and dye study that form part of the structure for the analysis of the evidence. The second article is a simple report on excavation coins from a late medieval site in southern Italy on the island of Stromboli. Although the coins are unspectacular, as is usual for um, excavation finds, the assemblage is collectively interesting as evidence for the circulation of diverse coinage in an outlying portion of the late medieval kingdom of Sicily. And last, but certainly not least, I'd like to mention some researchers whom I have assisted over the past year. These include William Day, reconstructing a horde of early Florentine Florins, of which the ANS owns a portion, Andrew Kurt, working on a monograph about the monetary system of Visigothic Spain, and Enno Gila, studying control marks and technical variation in the early round coins of China. Thank you. <laughs> now I have it over to Lucia Carboni. Okay, that's not necessary. I haven't begun yet. <laughs> okay, if I got, oh yeah, yeah, here we are. So, uh, let's begin with our, my uh, main uh, responsibility, which is the Riku Chonke collection. I already presented it last year. So, of course, uh, as promised, the preliminary cataloging uh, has been ended in November 2016. And uh, I updated the bibliography and the final entries of 2,000 coins. So it's really almost done. It's because they are fantastic coins, as you know, and so it takes it takes some time really to um, to, f to to do to finalize the entries. And on top of that, on the Wuchonke collection, we're going to have a graduate course uh, at the Columbia University in spring 2018, and I've already exactly planned some research project of students on that. And part of this, actually, we have one of the some sem seminar research project which wasn't part of the Wuchonke collection, so the latest of Laodicea. So. We have the publication of the catalog by the end of 2018. By the way, this is a fantastic Celtic coin um, exactly from, uh, from France and an international conference in spring 2019. I've already contacted some of the scholars and they responded very positively, of course. Okay, so, and on top of that, there of course there are these lead tokens uh, that I worked on and this is another part of the fantastic Wichonke collection, so. Um, regarding another of my passions, of course, which was uh, inherited by, from Rick, actually, is this late Sistofori. So the comprehensive study last year was presenting this complete dye study, which I actually finished of the latest story of Trales, uh, with this exactly 80, uh, 450 coins, with 80 adverse dice strata drugs and 40 adverse dice for systolic fractions. But I have to say that I have widened it, my project now uh, to, and so we have this the biggest actually it's a record ever found so over almost uh, 1400 coins with 517 uh, obverse dice for tether drugs 25 previously unknown issues this is basically is going to be and uh, this is all done uh, so i have just to so this is really in some way my uh, one of my main projects this year and so i uh, i will finish basically this book on the latest software so we have we have basically almost a whole Dice, complete dice study for the late story, which is a very important thing, which is transition from exactly Atali Kingdom and to, to the province of Asia and then uh, basically through the Mithradic Wars and so on. On. Then, of course, we have already talked about the Rich to Logan School, so that's it. I'm not going to say more. Uh, the only thing which is, I would, 
I said that I will not going to say more, but just one thing is this, uh, <laughs> there is this uh, Epura program, uh, which with this Paideia Institute, which is for living uh, uh, Latin and Greek. But the Epura program is something which is fantastic because it is for exactly teaching literacy with Latin and it's sort of a out, uh, outreach to middle school also in uh, underprivileged areas. So they're going to visit us. So this is really uh, something beautiful. So, and we are planning this. So, and uh, accession in cataloging, uh, I had the honor, of course, to, um, to, uh, to exactly preliminary uh, cataloging and accessioning. So, and I'm going to do that, this uh, fantastic batch of uh, Alexandrian coins, which were offered uh, uh, by a uh, sale auction by Gemini um, in April, April 2017. Um, it's a fantastic exactly group of coins because uh, like it's like uh, it's 54 coins we have already like almost 16,000 Alexandrian coins uh, provincial Alexandrian coins at ANS but on top of that but in spite of these 29 of these were actually not part of these collections and uh, two of these uh, are never been a uh, never been published apparently and uh, so the need further research is needed and the beautiful thing <coughs> is that uh, they come from the uh, very important datari collection which was exactly published in 1901 uh, and uh, and uh, yes actually 20 of them so it's really 25 of them so this is really nice and important. Okay, so I'll finish here and I give the word to Dulcis in Fundo, Eric Kraus. So thank you. Oops, too fast. Thank you, um, I'm honored to be here as a volunteer curatorial associate for United States Coins. Um, my activities since starting at the ANS this spring have concerned the following. Uh, completion of curatorial entries for the Corin collection of Gobrek dollars, uh, accessioning a donation of over 250 plaster models by former mint chief engraver Frank Gasparro, upgrading our photographic library of U.S. coins and tokens for Mantis, as pointed out, only 32% of the U.S. cabinet is photographed. We're going to fix that. Uh, working to facilitate the migration of the ANS database to collective access for the U.S. cabinet. Um, I'd like to discuss briefly the Goldbreg project in more detail. In 1836, a decision was made to revive production of the U.S. silver dollar after a gap of 32 years with a clean sheet design. The resulting creation was unlike anything previously seen in this nation's coinage. Executed by assistant engraver Christian Goldbrecht, the new dollar coin paired a seated goddess of liberty with a lifelike eagle flying against a background of 26 stars. The experiment was fraught with production glitches and ultimately failed, but not before some 1,500 of the Goldbrecht dollars among the most beautiful pattern issues in the U.S. series were produced. They were in such demand by early collectors that they were repeatedly restruck in various die combinations by, for those fortunate to have personal connections to mint staff. The Goldbrecht dollar has proven to be one of the most sought after U.S. mint products of all time. Uh, there are 18 recognized die marriages, including original issues, unofficial restrikes, off metal pièce de caprice, and muled die combinations. Of the 18, 12 varieties are represented by four or fewer known specimens, and four are unique. In 2008, Dr. Julius Corrin donated his entire collection of Goldbrecht dollars, the ever largest ever amassed by a single individual, to the ANS. This remarkable group has now been completely accessioned to the United States Cabinet and consists of 36 pieces representing 16 of the 18 dye varieties and four unique dye trials. 
our collection far exceeds the Gobrecht dollar holdings of any other major institution open to the public for scholarly study. For comparison, the Smithsonian has four examples, the Byron Reed Collection in Omaha, five, the Harry Bass Foundation, three, and the American Numismatic Association Muse Money Museum, zero. There are critical document documentary gaps in the Goldbrecht story. Because it is so necessary to work with the coins themselves and the ANS collection entirely unencumbered by third-party grading holders offers an unparalleled resource. <laughs> My research on the series has taken me to D.C. and Nebraska to acquire as extensive a set of measurements and photographs as possible. I have focused on unresolved questions pertaining <coughs> to the emission sequence of the reeded edge issues, the iconography of the starry sky reverse, and the factors contributing to the demise of this remarkable design concept. Um, I'd just like to say that I retired at the end of last year after 30 years of very intensive pediatric practice. I've been a member of the ANS for a long time, but haven't really been around much because of the work obligations. This is sort of a dream come true to be here. Thank you. Um, in, in closing out the curatorial reports, uh, it, it occurred to me um, as I went off script in my own presentation that uh, I forgot to acknowledge the tremendous hard work of two other curatorial members, uh, one of which is Ethan Gruber, who is the man who stands behind um, our um, digital projects. He, he's the one who keeps these digital engines running, and uh, Oliver Hoover as well, who has been doing a tremendous amount of work on the Seleucid Coinage uh, online project. I would also like to thank uh, Arthur Houghton and Mary Lannan also, who funded uh, um, some er earlier iteration and work on this Seleucid Coinage project as well, too. So thank you again for, for your attention. So.